No matter how much you think you love somebody, you'll step back when the pool of their blood edges up too close. Chuck Palahniuk. I have a violence in me that is hot as death blood. Sylvia Plath. Blood is that fragile scarlet tree we carry within us. Osbert Sitwell. If you will comply with my conditions, I will leave them and you at peace. But if you refuse, I will glut the maw of death until it be satiated with the blood of your remaining friends. Mary Shelley Let out the blood, let out the disease. Anonymous Human blood is a testament to life's origin in the ocean. Its chemical composition is nearly identical to that of seawater. Jacques Cousteau. Nurse, it is I who discovered that leeches have red blood. Baron Georges Cuvier, on his deathbed when the nurse came to apply leeches. My first year at college, and I was only there for a year and a half before I was sort of recruited away from it in a strange way, but uh, my freshman year, my roommates in the dorm was this big guy, his name was uh, Tasso, he was a Greek guy, he was very, very athletic, total jock type, very friendly, outgoing, beer drinker, popular guy, just involved in every sort of athletic pursuit. He and I got along pretty well. Uh, But the very first uh, winter break, he had to spend it in the hospital. He had developed some sort of inner ear problem that required surgery. Uh, It wasn't wasn't major surgery, and uh, I heard through the grapevine that he made it through the surgery fine, that he was recovering, and that he would be back for the beginning of spring term. And he did come back, but he he wasn't in the dorm a lot after that. He kind of came and went. His behavior was noticeably different. Um, he, he, he seemed very paranoid about something he claimed he had heard and sensed while he was under the anesthetic during his surgery. He claimed he had heard all through it the sound of his blood being pumped out of his body, as well as the new blood being pumped in. He claimed he heard this the system, this procedure. And everyone said, no, 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 you know, you... It's, that was just, it's, you probably had a, a post-op dream, strange things happened under anesthetic, that you, you were entirely out, don't, don't worry about it. But he got stranger and stranger about this. He, he started talking uh, in very, a very odd way, uh, sometimes he would disappear for three days at a time, and I had heard he stopped going to classes. One night, I was... Uh, in the dorm, and I woke up, and I didn't think he he was coming back. He'd been gone for a couple of days, but I, I looked over across the room, and I saw him sitting in the windowsill in the dark and looking out, and um, you know, far away there was this church that we used to, used to look out at. And uh, he got up without a word, and he, he lifted his mattress. He picked up a huge, huge buck knife. And he started to leave the dorm room. And I said, you know, Tazo, where, where, are you, where are you going? And he said that he was going back into the hospital. He started talking about how they had no right to steal his blood from him. And he was going there to get it back. And I, I tried to engage him in conversation, but he, he was very persistent. He looked really pale and strange. And he pushed, back, pushed past me and left the room out into the hallway, and it happened, it was well past midnight, but a friend of ours was coming in the other direction. It became, it became a big altercation. We were trying to talk some sense into Tasso, and he got a little bit, he got, very, he got agitated. And it, it ended with him kind of screaming and shouting, and, and, and us wrestling him to the ground, so that he would drop this knife, and, his, and drop his plan of, of going to the hospital in the middle of the night to get his blood back. But, 
We sort of led him away. His parents came to pick him up. We stayed up uh, until the campus police uh, kind of took him away. And he never returned to school. Um, I sort of lost track of what happened. Apparently he did get over this this episode. I, I wasn't aware at that time that there was such a thing as this this post-operative shock that sometimes the reaction to anesthetic, there can be a, a real somatic, psychological, physiological reaction. There can be paranoia. Uh, I heard secondhand that he did recover from this and it did eventually return to school, but it wasn't during the time that I was there. That was uh, that's the story of my first year roommate at, at college. That's it's 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 blood, right? I mean, that's the first. That's kind of the baseline for all signs of harm. Um, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't sure I was going to talk about this, but I myself have had to become a little more aware of of my own blood and what's going on with it. I um been sort of working with a doctor and have recently purchased recently purchased my own blood pressure cuff where I, you know, just to kind of be aware of what's going on in, in inside my body. I, I you know I have <laughs> I have one of these old you know it, it's the old style with the you know with the with the with the timer face and the little balloon that you put, you know, it's, it's, it's the whole, it's the whole, uh, cuff situation. Um, and so I, you know, it was interesting use, you know, learning how to use it. It's based on the millisecond that you, you know, you're letting out this pressure slowly and it's based on the millisecond that you hear your own pulse. So, um, you know, I, 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 I myself have just been, thinking about it's it sounds funny to say but I, I've been thinking about blood more how it's how it's um, it's with us all the time but it's such a mystery um, I remember some things from being a kid I was recently cleaning out some things from a, a storage room at my at my sister's and oh I found some old books of mine and, and I was reminded that you know, when I was, I don't even know what age I was, I was still in grade school, um, but I, I started to become a very uh, voracious reader of mysteries, because I, I tend to think of it as, as kind of horror light, you know, um, it, you know, you get suspense um, without as much abject terror, <laughs> possibly, but but again, I mean, that's really, you know, if I, a horror is just, is just a suspense as well. But I, the first book that I remember noticing in the bookstore, it was a little paperback. It was an Agatha Christie paperback because, you know, she's, there's so many. It's, it, was, it has this kind of adorable uh, cover. It's called A Holiday for Murder. It was a, a Poirot story. And uh, <sighs> strangely, uh, strangely enough, the epigraph really got to me because, I, you know, I didn't know this context but there there's an there's an epigraph in in i guess not all of the editions but in many of them that uh, from macbeth uh from uh, lady macbeth when she's uh sleepwalking uh that's yet who would have thought the old man to have so much blood in him agatha christie chose that because you know they're uh, after a period of of being sort of criticized for uh kind of milder uh murders <laughs> Nothing very viscerally shocking. There, there is a murder here that that um, is very bloody, and the scene, uh, you know, is 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 quite uh, quite a mess. And yeah, that idea of blood where it's not supposed to be, you know, blood spilling outside of its contained area. You know, I mean, who knows how much there is or how you know. I, I, I'm not sure if you remember that very strange um, ad campaign from, oh gosh, was it in the, where, uh, the, for The Shining, I don't know if it was on, I don't know where I saw it, it was on, you know, on regular television, or, but the whole, you know, elevator opening and the blood spilling out, like, there's something about, 
you know, you're, you're, you're kind of trying to do these, you're stabbing at these calculations in your head, like how much, how much blood is in a body? Could I, could I know it if I saw it? How much, what could that mean? Where could that blood come from? You know, like, because, you know, blood doesn't stay, you know, this perfectly sloshable and ruby red liquid for long. You know, it, 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 it congeals and it's, it's, it's quite a finite period of time when it has this, um, you know, all of these startling artistic uh, possibilities, right? Um, you know, again, I'll say on the one hand, such a, a natural subject, nothing to fear. Oh my God, we're filled, we're filled with blood, all of us. But it's also jarring and, and frightening and kind of gets to something, some sort of core protectiveness within us, like <laughs> the idea of spilling our, the idea of spilling our blood is very, very visceral and very, um, very startling. Anyhow, I, call me back when you, uh, when you get where it is you're going. My evening had been ordinary, nothing more nor less. But perhaps my own ordinary was different from everyone else's, even in those days. Before the nights became my enemy. Before the pain and the soft foods. Before the snows. At any rate, I sat in the white place of my apartment with shadows slanting from the deep corners of the doors. From me to the kitchen, to the bath, to the bed. I poured some amber scotch around ice. And here, if I'm honest with myself, I'd have to admit that it was probably earlier than most nights. They seemed to be moving in that direction. There came a knock at my door. In the hallway stood a man. He was smartly dressed with a jacket and a crisp tie. His smile was solid with a poised sweetness like a birthday cake. He seemed to come from a limbic space. I tried to remember who else had come to my door in my time here. Maybe nobody. But there must have been someone, sometime. Because I was not as afraid as I might have been. It did not seem as unnatural as all that. A knock. Well, the truth is, it did. It most certainly did. But I answered it anyway. I hope I'm not disturbing you, he said. Uh, no, I replied purposefully clipped. Can I help you? Well, his chin tilted down politely, I just recently came to this city. His right hand slipped into his pocket and retrieved something. To find you. We're related, you see. He held a square creased thing flat in front of his body. I was waiting. At first, I didn't think you were in. I thought you might have gone on vacation, maybe with somebody. His face soured to blank. You see, I had many difficult dreams. He turned the photo around. It looked very old. A woman sat half-turned in a tall chair. She had short, dark curls and a strand of beads hung above the scooped neck of her dress. I remember freezing. I could not know in that moment of his visits down the hall, making his way to my door. Nobody would know right away, not until they were found. The hair and teeth and pipes. The headless man in 116, the pile of steam and muscle in 103, the burbling stuffed sink in the studio on the end with the arched windows, which on sunny days looked out over an expanse of teal grass. It was already soaking out under the carpets and floorboards and rolling off the panels of stairs. I've had time nothing but naturally, to wonder if he was really searching for me. Or maybe he told the others the same thing. Whatever we were missing, we opened our doors. I still think 
privately and with a bulky shame that he is my blood from the tucked seams of my family somewhere. And in a way, I hope that he will find me again, that he will come to me and offer his hand. Each day echoes harder with his approach. He knows what he did to me, so he knows where I am. So your sound is pronouncedly different now. Is are you, are you inside? Uh, yeah, I am. Um, you probably realize from the uh, the very the very British sound of of a uh, fire truck that went by as I was on the highway. I mean, I'm in England. I'm in Cornwall, sort of on the edge of a uh, very cute town of St. Ives. I'm in something called the Church of St. Helen, a very, very old church. And I'm actually in, they're called the catacombs, but it's it's very, very tiny, small space. There's really not that much to it. But while I'm in Cornwall here, I wanted to visit this church because I'd heard there was some uh, very interesting graffiti from the Middle Ages. We're talking about this, this, this blood business. I, I swear, I, I walked in, into this church and you know, I have been given, given the sort of special permission here. I walk in, the first thing I, I, I thought of just this atmosphere, uh, you know, I didn't read much as a kid, but I, I think I read maybe a comic book uh, adaptation of The Mask of the Red Death, the Edgar Allan Poe story. And um, I was very, very frightened by that the the specter of this this um, this phantom in this sheet I remember with blood you know just everywhere and, and just the wording taken from the short story it's this mention of I don't know if it was the phrase crimson king was actually in the story or just I heard it later but I remember as a kid uh, each successive adaptation of the Mask of the Red Death that I saw either in a book with illustrations or a, some of the form just it, it grew worse and worse in my imagination, it grew more and more terrifying. I couldn't even tell you what the story was about when I was a kid. Uh, I just knew that this thing showed up, this big echoing hall, and just suddenly there was just blood and death everywhere. Um, and to this day, I, I just, I, I won't go anywhere, anywhere near that story, but it's going to have it all came flooding back when I came in this big empty church. But I, actually, I am. I'm actually directly in front of this this little space, this little dark space, where has been written on the wall uh, graffiti that is now almost 700 years old now. And I actually, I have I have my hand on the words right now. But you have to understand, you, you, this can't be read with the naked eye anymore. It's been a few hundred years since it could be. It's completely faded, and it, it took a, a fair bit of science some technology to sort of bring these words to light that are etched here. I can just faintly with my fingers feel the indentations. I'll read you these words as they appear on this on this stone. Someone wrote, for 20 months this parish hid under rivers of blood without and within. We still pray we still clean the walls. 1351. Those are the words of, uh, inside here, the Church of St. Helen, written. Uh, that was uh, 1351. It would have been about uh, only about a year after the uh, the Black Plague finally kind of um, loosened its grip on, on this part of England. That is intense. I'm not sure where I first came across this, but I recently was um, doing some reading on, interestingly enough, um, barber poles, the history of barber poles, because, you know, I, <laughs> it's not that I'd given them much thought, but I, it's one of these uh, traditions that I've noticed that has been preserved, you know, the, so you think of a barber pole, right? You 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 picture this kind of this tube <laughs> outside of a, a barber shop, 
uh, that um, may or may not be kind of rotating, you know, um, uh, red stripes or red and blue stripes on a white on a white background. The origins for this kind of sign uh, go back to the Middle Ages. Uh, a barber was not j simply a barber um, in those days. It, they they were they were kind of did a little bit of everything. They were they were barber surgeons, if if you will. Um, that's also where the kind of short coat, um, in comparison to the long coat of a physician, the short coat came into play. The barber pole was, it was kind of like a whole lot of signals wrapped into one. Um, they didn't all have all of these characteristics, but these are all typical of, um, so the barber pole would have, you know, the, the, the stripes, there usually was some kind of a bulb or a bowl on the top and on the bottom. Uh, th this was to signify that you could come to this place to um, to have bloodletting done, uh, which was kind of both a sort of a prophylactic and a therapeutic <laughs> solution for pretty much anything medically uh, that could have been wrong with you back then. The stripes, the red was, you know, indicating blood. <laughs> The blue was also indicating, indicating blood. Um, the the white uh, would suggest that you could also have your dental work done there. You know they would uh, barbers would uh, barbers would groom you. They would also perform um, medical and surgical procedures as well as dental ones. So this was so you could identify you know these these um, these spots. Uh, from the road, uh, you could you could see that this was a place you could go to 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 have your blood let out if something was wrong with you. Um, usually, usually meant you had too much blood. Um, and the design again did vary, but usually the uh, you know there was some sort of an indicator up top, whether it be kind of a dome or a bulb. Or even a bowl shape. It, it was um, many times to indicate. It, it was to kind of represent where leeches would be kept, and then the bowl or the dome under on the bottom of the pole was to indicate, you know, a, a, a space where where your extra blood could run into. <laughs> was it uh, something about the white was also? Um hearkens to the, the color of bone? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, it kind of gives a whole, it gives a whole t new dimension to the consideration of the colors of the American flag. The red color was kind of, um, was most obviously referring to blood. Uh, the white color, yes, they, um, as I mentioned, they could perform dental procedures on your white teeth, or they could also set bones that were broken uh, and, uh, you know, the blue, um, well, the blue color was actually passed on as the two professions, uh, split, uh, that the, the blue was kind of carried with the more, more, uh, more traditional medical side of the equation. Uh, so that's why you'll see, you'll see that attached. Um, but there's also the blue of, um, blood that's not oxygenated. Kind of fascinating and macabre. Well, you know, the, you know, this church is just a, kind of an ancillary benefit of me coming to Cornwall. They actually have a bit of a bit of a strange situation going on here. That's why I really came to kind of, kind of oh, poke around and just kind of be here while this is going on. They actually have a, uh, they seem to have a serial killer situation going on, very new for this area oh, it's three victims of the course of the last 13 months and please now believe it it is definitely all the same individual so i just thought i'd come and and uh, read up on the situation talk to some people and the interesting thing about what's going on here with this there's some sort of desanguination ritual going on you know that the the, uh, the the movie trope of oh, the, the the killer who has who seems to possess a medical skill 
who works in a very precise fashion to do strange things to these bodies. They just have this, oh, this scalpel edge talent. The opposite seems to be the case here in Cornwall with this person. Probably shouldn't be saying this because this is somewhat privileged information that I've gotten from, from someone. Uh, the, the killer seems to be trying to release as much blood post-mortem as they can, but they're doing a terrible, terrible job of it. Creating a giant mess, apparently, in all three cases. Um, trying to collect the blood of the victims to do what? No one is sure, but in each case, it's just not working out. It's been messy. It's been clumsy. Uh, a different technique for the bloodletting has been used each time, apparently, and nothing is working for this killer's purposes. And what they have found uh, in each case is beyond you know, the ghastly facts of the murder itself. It's apparently each case has been kind of a a disaster of technique. Just yes, that is completely um, a requisite for any dramatic scripted serial killer story, right? That you know, there's always there's always the moment where you know, well, uh, the killer obviously has medical knowledge or training. You know, it, it, it's also one of the you know, I think the reasons that it's been. Um, the advances in, in, in DNA technology have been so exciting because, I mean, it's one of the things, it gets everywhere. It's, it, you can't escape blood. It gets everywhere, you know, I, and it's, it's usually one of the, the, one of the things that you'd understand uh, trying to bleach out or, or scrub away or get rid of any way you can, but it's, uh, you know, it, the, the, um, with each passing year, it just, it seems that those kinds of actions grow more futile um, as everything gets more and more recognizable and detectable. But this person is almost, it sounds like they're, I mean, I'd say they're flaunting it, but I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, if I could share a quote uh, from my acquaintance here on the police force, uh, referring to this person's lack of anatomical skill, uh, he said, it's almost like this guy has never even cut open a doll before. So this happened not far from here. There was a motel out by the old highway. There used to be a little diner there, too, and a gas station. But they were gone by this time. She owned this place for a while. I don't know how many years. One day, it was just like any normal day, checkout hour came and went. There were just two rooms occupied the night before. In one was a couple with a young child who were staying on a few days. And then a man who had arrived very late, just after three in the morning, and seemed to have left by dawn. There weren't a lot of people that stopped there, it was the only thing around, so she'd get truck drivers or people from somewhere on their way to somewhere else and got tired or didn't plan on seeing such empty land out there for so many miles. The people stopped in at all hours. Strange people. So it wasn't all that unusual, really. She didn't think much of it. But when she went into the room the next morning, something was off. One of the two beds looked slept in. The spread folded crisply over at the foot. The room key was laying atop the TV. The first weird thing was that the air conditioner was popping every few seconds, which the units usually did for a couple of minutes after they were shut off. But then they would stop. There was a box on the floor, squared neatly between the bed's maybe like two or three feet in length and a foot tall, like that. It was stuck loosely closed with the original strip of gray tape across the top. Just a little, just on one end. She smelled something, she said. 
like coins. She reached her foot out to test it, and the moment she barely made contact, the corner of it bent in, and the box gave way, and dark red blood soaked it and burst the top and the edges and sloshed out over her shoe and over the thin rug. She ran outside and was sick, and ran into the office and locked the door behind her and called for someone to come. She said it was warm still, and she couldn't stand the feeling, so she rinsed her feet in the tub and kept rinsing. See, I heard another story like this. I mean, it isn't like this, but it's the only thing I can call back to here. Two friends were traveling, and, hungry and tired, they stopped at a highway cafe. They inspected the laminated menus, stitched up the sides with a black polyester, and the woman turned her head to read the chalkboard specials. It was just a few seconds, but when she turned back, her friend, who worked as a magician, an illusionist, he liked to insist, pulled his menu aside, which he'd been holding open book-style in front of him, to reveal a large block of ice. He beamed expectantly. She stared at him as the ice began to melt on the table and drip down into their laps, soaking the open rack of sugar packets, and started to cry. See, they were going to an event, somewhere he was expected to perform, and he was grateful to her for driving him and for being his friend, and this was his gift. There was no reason this could have happened. No way in hell. But somehow it did. Anyhow, she never could say how the box held, unlined with tape or plastic or anything. How you could get the blood to fill it so fast that it didn't even have time to soak through, to burst and leak. It was only cardboard. A shipping box. It could only hold for seconds before it broke. And who was the man? And where had he gone? If he was really gone. And where had it come from? The blood. It was later said to be human. And the man had disappeared. I don't know what happened after that.